Hi, I'm Norman Perello, a furniture designer, maker at Perello Design and woodworking educator at WoodSkills and today I'll be presenting the most used jigs in my furniture making. Jigs also considered a, uh, woodworking or workbench appliances. The four jigs are the uh, thicknessing sled, the dovetail jig, the bench hook and the shooting board and I've made uh, considerable improvements over these uh, different uh, jigs or appliances over the years and I'll, I'll discuss that, I'll delve into that and give demonstrations of how I use the individual uh, jigs in my uh, furniture making. I use these jigs extensively. Uh, I can't really do without them anymore because I've since I've progressed to hand tool woodworking they've become a uh, uh, critical part of my furniture making. I made a, uh, a change in my uh, furniture making from uh, primarily machine tool woodworking to hand tool woodworking with some machines in the early phases of the furniture making. These workbench jigs or appliances are instrumental in, uh, in how I perform my furniture making and I also wanted to demonstrate how you can create these and once you begin to use them you'll become more uh, adept at using them and they'll be, you'll be more comfortable at using them and you'll understand the advantages they have over setting up a machine adjusting it and uh, changing a bit for example in a router table as opposed to uh, using a, uh, a jig, a workbench jig designed for hand tool woodworking. Stay tuned and I'll be discussing each one of these workbench jigs or appliances individually. I'm Norm Perillo from WoodSkills and I like to talk about a few woodworking books I've uh, written. My recent book is Quiet Woodworking in an Unquiet World. It talks about my movement to uh, hand tools from high tech to low tech, a woodworker's journey which chronicles my journey from my former high tech career to my uh, current furniture making career. Along with that I offer courses through WoodSkills.com. The courses range from a basic woodworking course right through the furniture design and a comprehensive design and making course. All books are available in both print and digital format. The first jig is the uh, thicknessing sled. I'm giving a demonstration of how to use it. So it involves a, uh, a sled that's adapted to your uh, your block plane, although you can size it up for a smoother, a small smoother, but it works on of an inch. And this is the actual uh, thicknessing sled with the spacer and the track for the block plane in more detail. This is a profile view and I set it up so I can insert it into my uh, bench dog holes on the workbench so it locks it in and works really well. Again, we'll continue with the demonstration. So I'm actually thicknessing this uh, Kamiko strip down to a predetermined size, which is based on the uh, on a spacer that I've inserted in the below the track. So you can actually replace the spacer with a different size, different thickness spacer, and then I just move the block plane along. Make sure the uh, the wood is in a correct uh, grain orientation when you're doing this, so the grain's rising. So you don't have any tear out. And it works really well for uh, for small components. You can size this up or scale it up to uh, a larger unit with a, uh, a larger thicknessing sled for uh, adapted to uh, smoother planes if you wish. So I've used this extensively in my Kamiko uh, making for uh, for thicknessing the uh, the strips down to uh, a five uh, three three thirty second thickness. And it makes everything uniform right across. So the length of the, uh, the sled is determined by the largest or the longest uh, component you have. So I've uh, sized this up to about 16 to 18 inches, this sled. So I'm checking the components now for fit. But it's an excellent way to, uh, to thickness small components. And I use this, uh, it's actually on my workbench, one of my workbenches at all times. I have two similar workbenches and I, so I use this extensively in my work, in my furniture making and Kamiko. Next is the dovetail jig. This is the, uh, the dovetail jig on the side of uh, the surface of the uh, workbench. 
And this is how I would lay out the, uh, the tail and the pin board. So what I'll do is I'll remove the, uh, the tail board and I'll remove the pin board and just go through the whole sequence. And you notice these are uh, spring loaded. The cleats will move up automatically and this helps a great deal. So it becomes a one handed thing to, uh, to adjust. And there's uh, sandpaper attached to the inside faces of the uh, cleats. Again, you can have larger, wider uh, cleats on end, bulkier cleats if you uh, work with larger components, uh, drawer components, I don't. So this is a, uh, a pre-made uh, pin board. For example, I would do this, set that up and then just tighten it loosely and then use uh, either my, uh, my, sh my shop mate So it's perfectly aligned and it's vertical. That's also another another important point is to have it flush with the uh, surface of the uh, of the dovetail jig itself. So if I were to, if I needed to transfer these tails to this pin board, I would uh, line it up and use one of the uh, use one of these saddle squares I have, either this one. Again, this is not ideal. It works. It works well, but it, you need to grip it very carefully because it's, it's it's a narrow and it pivots. Also, this is a little more stable. This saddle square is fairly inexpensive too, so that works too. Although I would uh, ideally, this would this component here would be longer. You could use that. So I've designed this saddle square for this particular jig, and also a. Uh, it's versatile, I can use it for other things, but this it has a long moment, so I can uh, set this up and that's, uh, that's perfectly aligned now. Here I'll remove it again and use my, uh, my more recent a flip style saddle square. And this is uh, just using, I created using some offcuts. It cost me nothing and I had the hinge already. So I would you flip it, put it here and set it up. And there's a, just a small a faint line here so I know where the, uh, how far to go with tails. And just, uh, I said the sandpaper helps a great deal. So once you've got it slightly tightened, you can let go of this and uh, not quite, not quite far enough there. So this would be uh, accurately or precisely set in both, both the ends are uh, coplanar with each other and it's uh, exactly perpendicular the boards are actually perpendicular to each other in uh, both planes and are not pivoted. And that's what this does. So I can confirm that with this side. So 90 degrees and 90 degrees. So, so at this point I could transfer the tails. I don't have a marking knife here, but I would normally transfer the tails to the pin board and then uh, remove them. And uh, so I can use this dovetail jig also as uh, demonstrated in the previous one, uh, second to last video on actually chopping the, uh, the tails or the pins. What I would do is, uh, for example, if I had to chop, chop the pin, the tails, sorry, I'd line this up here. And I line this up with the baseline, so I don't really need to ensure that it's square or anything, although I could check for that. Let me just remove this. But I never really have to do this because I just I use the baseline as an indicator on the cleat. So too far back. You can clamp it down, and then what I do is I just uh, I just chop away. I usually go uh, halfway down and then flip the board over and do the other half without actually touching the, uh, the surface of the dovetail jig with a, with a chisel. And again, this also, the dovetail jig itself 
protects your uh, workbench surface. And you can also place a small board, a small thin one eighth board underneath the dovetail, the tail board, and that or pin board, and that protects it. And I'll just set up the uh, so that's the tail board. Now, if I were the pin boards are always thicker because it's a drawer front and that's a drawer side. So I need to release that. The springs really make a difference. So I would line this up like this with the baseline. Again, I could use a combination square or an, engine, an engineer square. I have two of these jigs and I've been using them for uh, 18 years now. So I think all my dovetails are created on this. So something I developed uh, going on 20 years almost, I would say. So. Next is the bench hook. This is a bench hook and I use, I have about three or four of these now. One at every bench and a couple of extra in my earlier workbenches, so a total of four maybe. And I use this extensively in my work. What this allows me to do is cross cut pieces to length. And if you set it up with a, with a stop block, you can actually create uniform size pieces. And what it does is it creates pieces, but very with very fine uh, finish at the end. So you almost need hardly any finishing, maybe run it through a shooting board afterwards, which I'll, I'll show you. So you can set up, uh, it's, it's a base with a fence and the fence has openings in it, curves at uh, predetermined angles of uh, 90 degrees or 45 degrees. And then if you flip it over, uh, the reason there's two fences, one actually isn't a fence, one, they're both fences, but one serves as a, as a cleat to hold it against the uh, surface of the workbench. So this is an example of how the fences are set up perpendicular to the base. The fences also serve as cleats, and the next images are the how it's actually uh, attached or placed along the edge of a workbench using the same fences. Or uh... Uh, what this allows me to do is uh, is use the uh, bench hook to uh, to cross cut pieces of wood to length. Now, one of the issues with uh, and because you can flip it over and set this side up with different angles, so you have. 90, 45, but you can easily set it up for 30, 30 degrees or 60 degrees, whatever angles to be. And because they're so easy to make and quick to make, uh, you can have multiples of these. This is a, a unique version that I created uh, for an article in a, in a woodworking, uh, sorry, in a magazine uh, a couple of years ago. And it has uh, openings for dogs. And the reason I have that is because if you, if you use a... Uh, a bench hook against uh, against the, on the surface of a a workbench like I'm doing here. It's hard to keep it from rocking. Really have to do multiple things: hold the wood and uh, against the fence and hold the fence. And so to eliminate. This is the, uh, the piece I've just cut off, and it's very clean. You can just actually a shine on the surface. And again, this is a very, very fine back saw that I tend to use with this. And you can see the kerf is, uh, is a 32nd inch wide or something. And because it's a back saw, you're limited in the depth. Now, this back saw, these uh, fence heights are uh, work, are designed around this particular saw. And you can see the back saw, the, uh, the folded uh, back hits the, or doesn't actually hit the bottom. So that's important. If you're determining the height of the fence, you want to work uh, work with uh, with the, the tool or the saw you're going to use the most at that bench hook. You can always have a shorter fence, but I prefer taller fences. And I think this one's a little bit shorter. So these, uh, these last a long time, if you're careful with them, and what I've done here is I put a, a hardwood face, and glued a hardwood uh, face on the on the front. Now, going back to this design, what the dog holes do is allow me to uh, lock it into place using a, a wooden dog. So this again, it's all customized for your workbench, and that's that's the idea. So this keeps it from rocking. And lastly, the uh shooting board 
So the, the shooting board itself is uh, working with hand tools, really, really neat to make one of these, build one of these. They're very straightforward to make. I offer plans. It uh, comes with it. You can create it with attachments, and that's the difference with, uh, with mine. Though this is the uh, 45, so this works. Uh, bolting this down. So if I'm doing a 45, again, I would... Uh, So this cleans the uh, it's a little too thick. Yeah, it's 45 degree adjustment. It's 45 degrees. So, so I'll put that aside. Again, if you're building a basic one, you can use one of your existing long sole planes to uh, use the shooting board. The more recent shooting board I'm using. And I'll show you that. This is my uh, my most recent go-to shooting board. And I'll tell you what I've done with this. This is actually the uh, one of the original shooting boards with left-hand orientation that I created for that fine woodworking article way back when. And this uh, this attachment uh, does case miters. So yeah, this is uh, an example of a case miter. This is uh, 45 degrees. So this would be uh, a small compartment. A box a drawer and so it's important to have the, uh, the corners of 45 degrees and that's accomplished through the uh, through this uh, this attachment so if I'm not using the attachment I can uh, switch it up with so if I push this away this would be uh, the other attachment Again, this does uh, this does case miters and this does face miters. So a face miter, an idea. This is a this is a face miter. So the uh, the idea is the same. So please subscribe to my YouTube woodworking channel where I share more of my woodworking techniques, my, uh, my woodworking philosophy, my thoughts on woodworking and uh, all the challenges I've experienced and uh, I introduce some of the uh, new forms of woodworking I've discovered. And also visit uh, woodskills.com where I have a good selection of uh, my books both in print and digital format on woodworking and uh, all my online courses and uh, I offer, also offer some woodworking plans. I have maintained a, uh, a regular blog on uh, what I've got going on in my workshop and uh, in woodworking in general. So enjoy!